Welcome, everyone. Thank you for dialing in. My name is Liz Powell, and I am the founder of G2G Consulting, which stands for Government to Growth. My job is just to kick things off today and then pass to the experts. So I think we can move to the next slide. This is what we wanna to cover today. We'll start off with a little bit of background. Some of you know us and some of you do not. So we wanna start off with that. And then we're gonna dive into the different funding sources that are available, talk about how to track grants effectively, and then talk about this amazing conference that we've been going to for many years now. Uh, that's all about uh, military health innovation, military health care. And you know, there's so many dual applications that it really does extend out to the entire uh, healthcare system. So it's a really phenomenal conference and we're really excited to tell you about it. We have a very special guest today um, who uh, can give some real expertise, uh, expert advice on how to navigate that conference. We're also going to share some insights on DOD funding. A lot of people find it uh, very difficult, don't know where to start, so we want to help you out with that. And we're going to close out with some Q&A. So you can start to put your questions into the Q&A box or you can wait until the end, but we definitely want to take your questions. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Um, so uh, again, I started G2G uh, back in 2007, which is crazy long time now. I cannot believe it. Um, I had previously worked on Capitol Hill. I had staffed the Armed Services Committee, the Small Business Committee, the Women's Caucus, helped launch the Disabilities Caucus. I did a lot in health. Um, and the whole reason I started G2G is because I met a lot of entrepreneurs like you, as well as some nonprofits doing great work, especially in health, health innovation, health access, but not necessarily knowing how to navigate government. And since I had worked in government, I thought, ooh, I could be that bridge. So G2G is all about growth, government to growth. And since I started, we've raised over half a billion dollars um, and uh, in funding, government funding for our clients. We've navigated CMS reimbursement, FDA approval, regulatory challenges, this new TSET program, um, shaped policies on Capitol Hill. We're now working very closely with um, the White House on this new initiative on women's health research. So a lot of different activities, all with government at the core. And um, life sciences, high-tech innovation is definitely our niche. Um, and both on the for-profit, nonprofit side, um, and we have an amazing monthly tracking system that I can take no credit for because my awesome colleagues, uh, Heather and Aditya really head that up, but they track all the new funding opportunities that are coming out. They curate it in a really well-organized format. So it's super easy to find um, the area of interest and see if it's a match for your innovation and if it's a good funding opportunity for you. Um, that is very important to track sort of the landscape of opportunities, but then you also need to have insights on what exactly program managers are looking for? What are their pain points? And that's where um, relationship development comes in. Um, and our guest speaker today is gonna have some good insights on that. But just so you know, grant tracking alone is not enough. Like you really do need to go to conferences like the one we're gonna talk about today. You need to interact personally to listen to what the pain points are so that you make sure you really are a good fit. Um, and then women's health is, is huge this year, but it's been huge for a while. There's been many working for many years. Um, I feel like it's finally having its moment. I call 2024 the year of women's health. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there. And it doesn't just mean conditions solely impacting women. It means conditions disproportionately impacting women and conditions that differently impact women. So we're in heart health month. Um, heart disease, number one killer of women, not just men. So uh, when you do studies, are you... Uh, including women in the clinical trials? Are you reporting sex-based data? So women's health can cross a lot of different things. And we're interestingly, we're seeing more and more interest within DOD because it's the fastest growing population within defense. So not to go off on that too much, but there is real uh, interest there now. And I think some funding that is following um, very soon. ARPA-H is about to make some big announcements on that. Our locations, you can see we're in a bunch of different places. Since I started G2G in the Midwest, we will always have a strong Midwest presence, but we have national clients. We work in many different states, obviously, and in D.C. as well. And then you can see our different affiliations. We work with a lot of bio chapters, different state bio chapters. We've got a great uh, Midwest contingency of bio chapters we're working with to make sure their members have access to capital, especially government funding, non-dilutive capital. 
Um, so if you're in any of those groups, make sure you are dialing in for our GBG reporting service because that is a phenomenal member benefit just for you. We offer consultation as well. So there's like a really nice um, collaboration happening across the bio chapters. We also work with these different defense affiliate organizations. Um, and uh, I talked about the women's uh, initiative with the gate. AIDS Foundation, we did a whole initiative with that last year in the Office of Research on Women's Health. So there's lots of different organizations, companies that we work with, um, all with this common um, theme around health innovation and health access. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, we can be a resource for you on other things, um, but we definitely want to make sure you are prepared for MHSRS. And with that, I'd love to pass it back to Greg. Great. Thanks a lot, Liz. Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Kapkar. I'm in our Midwest office in Cleveland, Ohio, in the health tech corridor here in the area. I've been with G2G for um, going on seven years, starting March 1st of this year, and work primarily with our portfolio of companies in the federal space and especially around DOD and other agency connections. So really excited to have everybody here. And I'll start off with this disclaimer that uh, absolutely, the views and opinions that are expressed um, here and by all of the speakers are our own and not representative of the DOD. And anything that you see visually that is DOD information or its components doesn't imply that they are constituting endorsement or anything. So we can go to the next slide. So I um, wanted to start off with just a, a quick overview of some government funding sources. And companies often come to us who are generally just looking at grant funding. And Liz said that it's more than grants. And there are three other categories, including grant funding. And we could probably spend an entire session on these alone. And in fact, we do other sessions on these. But the first is around federal legislation and specifically the 12 appropriations bills, as well as the authorization bill through the National Defense Authorization Act. And there are opportunities here to um, work on uh, report language and get some policy or funding into those pieces of legislation. And in fact, now is the time to be thinking about that for fiscal year 25 as appropriations forms and uh, Defense Authorization Act forms and requests are actually starting to be due as of early this Friday. Um, so that's an option. And then discretionary funding um, is that funding that agencies or particular program have within their budget that they can, they've got the discretion to spend it. And there, there are pockets of money. Um, you'll hear Department of Defense talk about restoral dollars. And these are funds that kind of come in at the end of the fiscal year that maybe there's a priority that there's this white paper or project that's sitting in their drawer that they've wanted to get to and these funds become available. Those types of things uh, uh, are potentially options for companies. And then procurement is the side of working with government where they're actually buying your particular product. And that's a whole other um, effort in and of itself. But the, the main takeaway from this slide is this pie chart. And the other common feature that we find in companies that we work with is that many are so focused on NIH and NSF. And the thing to take away from this slide is look at the sliver of pie in terms of kind of budget comparison and how much they have to spend. And the biggest chunk of the pie here is with DOD. And so if your company has never worked with the DOD or thought about its technology or innovation in the context of how could I, or how could this technology fill priorities and gaps within the military, uh, the military medical space, this is definitely a, a webinar for you. And we're gonna get into that. And um, within this pie, within the DOD of defense, uh, $8 billion, or $851 billion, now, not all of that is necessarily available for research, but there's huge chunks of money, like a billion dollars that the Medical Research and Development Command has pulled through. And then there are the centers of excellence that have their own budget. So there are, there are many avenues and pathways that um, companies can, can work with the DOD, work with government to see where there's potentially non-dilutive funding for what you're working on. So... The big trick is to figure out where your company fits, what are the gaps, and how can you help? And that's really what we're going to talk about here in um, probably a few more minutes when we dive into the military health system and we talk to retired Colonel Stuart Tyner, who managed a portfolio of like $500 million in infectious disease, among other things. But we'll, we'll get to Stu, Stuart here in a little bit. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
Liz mentioned our grant tracking and our government bioscience grants report, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time here just mentioning this, and it's a compilation of monthly opportunities for the life sciences and high-tech industries that's curated from multiple sources. Heather on our team and, and Aditya and I, um, this, is, this is something that we pull together every month. The report contains a quick summary of the opportunity and numbers and description and a link. But the other thing that we provide with this particular service is on the third Thursday of every month, we do a, a highlights call where for 30 minutes, it's open to anybody. Anybody can dial in. The link is here to where you can go to that. And then we actually review the report that came out for that particular month and highlight new opportunities. Then for the second half hour, um, this happens every third Thursday of every month from 12 to one. So the first half hour is free, it's open to everybody. The second half hour is a private consultation for clients of G2G or companies that are members of specific bio chapters. And it's in that session that we take a deeper dive and do uh, this uh, one, uh, well, it's a ecosystem of, of companies where we talk through what opportunities are coming, we answer questions, we talk about conferences, and we help position companies to take great advantage of the, the not only the grant funding, but also going to these events that they can reach program managers and people who are making decisions. So I did want to just put in a real quick plug for that and mention that if by chance, one of your, if your company is a member of Bio Nebraska, Bio Utah, Focused Ultrasound Foundation, Illinois Bio, Indiana Health Industry Forum, Iowa Bio, Michigan Bio, North Carolina Biotech, Ohio Life Sciences, South Dakota Biotech, or Virginia Bio. Those are all bio member cha bio chapters that make the GBG report and the webinar that we do every month as a member benefit. So if you're a member of any of those organizations, you're, you're welcome to dial in. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So I did wanna spend a little bit of time right before we get into the Military Health System Research Symposium, which will take up the rest of the time, I did wanna just turn our attention to the military health system and veterans affairs in general. And the military health system is part of the DOD, the Department of Defense, and veterans affairs is its separate, it's its own department. But just wanted to set the scope of how big these systems are. And just in the MHS system alone, there are over 9 million beneficiaries in the military health system. And the, they have their own system of hospitals and medical clinics. And you can see the numbers here, <clears throat> excuse me. And then same goes for Veterans Affairs. Um, and I should mention that the annual budget for the military health system has a big, uh, it's about 7% of the total DOD, DOD outlay of money. And the MHS system is um, $58 billion in terms of its budget. And then Veterans Affairs has its own system of um, integrated service networks and clinics and nursing homes, and their annual budget is around $140 billion in health expenditures. So wanted to just kind of set the tone for how big these systems are. And again, if we can find a way for your companies to tap into those, some of the key areas of interest for the MHS and VAs are listed here. This is not an exclusive or an exhaust, I should say it's not an exhaustive list by any means. And we will go into many of the topics that are covered in the Military Health System Research Symposium Conference, and that's going to be coming up. So I'll pause there and turn it over to Aditya on our team to walk us through MHSRS. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, so yeah, let's go over MHSRS, the Military Health System Research Symposium, in a little bit more uh, detail. Um, so as has been mentioned previously, I think this is the largest annual military medical conference of the year. It typically lasts uh, four days, uh, and it's typically held in August in Kissimmee, Florida. And those details are to be confirmed, but that is where it's where it's usually held for the last decade or so. Um, and so this is a meeting that's really, really well attended by um, movers and shakers from various quarters, private industry, academia, clinicians, researchers, both intramural and extramural from DOD, DOD healthcare leadership, DOD program managers, 
um, and VA managers as well. Um, and so last year, if I'm looking at my stats correctly, there were about 3,800 3, attendees. So it is a very large conference um, um, compared to a lot of other smaller and more niche meetings that you might be familiar with. Um, the conference is, tip is, is divided into four really broad areas of focus, uh, which are listed here. So warfighter medical readiness, expeditionary medicine, warfighter performance, and return to duty. And as with any other conference, the program is further divided into about 50, give or take, breakout sessions under these focus areas. And they encompass a variety of uh, research and um, scientific priorities for the DoD, um, including, but not limited to, things like infectious disease, hemorrhage control, pain management, regenerative medicine, predictive analytics and decision-making, mental health, traumatic brain injury, and as Liz mentioned at the top of the call, women's health as well as becoming an increasing area of focus for folks um, at the DOD. Um, and so this is a scientific conference. Um, so there are um, both uh, poster presentations and podium presentations that you can submit an abstract to to present at this forum. Um, so poster presentations take place over three different um, sessions. Podium presentations happen in individual breakout sessions as is typical in, in these conferences. Um, I will also say that this forum provides a um, exhibit hall for vendors uh, to highlight their products and services over the course of the conference. I will say that um, the key aspect is this, is this last point here. Um, this is a scientific conference and it's very, very technical information is being presented and shared at this forum. However, the benefits of attending this conference, even if you don't necessarily submit an abstract or, you know, actually presenting your science are, are, are many. Are many. Um, even if they don't, even if your work or interests don't necessarily align with any specific breakout sessions, um, the, intel, the intel that you gain from attending this conference is unparalleled. Um, you're hearing, you'll be hearing directly from very high level um, leaders of the DOD on ongoing and emerging priorities of the military health system. And that knowledge can help you frame your work or reframe your work so it's better aligned with DOD priorities. Um, it is an unparalleled net opportunity to network. Um, even if someone you talk with is not necessarily the right person for you, there is an excellent chance that he or she knows at least half a dozen other people in their network that they can tap into and connect you with. Um, and lastly, well, it's not just basic, even if it uh, sounds basic, just getting exposure to the military health system and the DOD, which it, it's important. It's a little bit overwhelming, but you have to attend these types of forums and gain exposure to understand how, how this whole system works. You can get a foothold here. It takes time. Um, it takes multiple touch points, um, but getting, but starting at this conference is a really, is a really good, um, it's a really good uh, thing to do. Um, just go to the next slide. So I talked about abstracts. I won't dwell too much on this, um, but I want to reiterate that if you do want to present work, um, either in the form of a podium presentation or as a poster, abstract submission um, is currently open, but will close in about one week's time uh, on February 21st. Um, and we can put the links, relevant links um, in our follow-up or in the, in the chat box if you're interested in submitting. Um, just going a little bit further into abstract submissions themselves. So general guidelines, as with other scientific conferences, you'll have to register an account on the MHSRS website. Um, and whatever you're submitting as your abstract, it should be original unpublished work. Again, that's fairly standard. You can submit the same or similar abstracts for other conferences, but if you get accepted at more than one, you have to choose which meeting, uh, a single meeting to uh, present that work in. And again, not, 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 a, not a significant difference from other meetings you may have attended. I will also state that, um, again, this is a scientific conference, scientific technical conference, product promotion, sale pitches are not gonna be accepted as part of abstracts. I would reserve that for if you intend to uh, work the exhibit hall or for individual conversations you have with, um, with folks. And again, as part of the standard um, process, you'll have to put together a conflict of interest form that's on the, uh, on the website. In terms of individual formatting, um, unlike a lot of other scientific conferences, however, um, the abstract for, for MHSRS is, um, is uh, very, um, very tight and condensed. Um, it's only plain text, no tables, pictures, or videos can be included. So 
if you are used to using those um, techniques to get your point across, you're going to have to think about doing that more in words in a very condensed form. Um, so it is a very short, relatively short abstract. Um, the title, again, 255 character limit. The length of the actual abstract itself um, is 2,500 characters or about 300 odd words. Um, this is significantly shorter than what it was last year, which I believe was 8,000 characters. So definitely really need to keep your descriptions of what your work is very, very tight and within the confines of that, of that limit. Again, short disclaimer needs to be included and um, key to formatting here, the substance of your abstract must address some learning objectives. What are attendees who are either coming to your talk or your poster, what are they gonna learn and be able to do at the end of the session? They're really big on action verbs as well, describe, analyze, discuss. Um, and you have, again, that 255 limit per learning objective within your abstract. So just some things to keep in mind. And then going into a little bit more detail, um, I just want to close out by saying that there's two different types of abstracts that are accepted um, uh, at this forum. So this is the second year that they're doing this. They initiated this last year, if memory serves. Um, the first is fairly conventional research type abstracts. Uh, should be familiar to anyone who's attending your standard conference. So include interim materials, methods, results, conclusions, um, focus on data. Um, so that's more of the basic science type work you can present. Secondly is advanced product development abstracts. So this is for more mature efforts. If you have a technology, a product or service that can really link into a key DOD capability gap, this is probably the one that you should be submitting. Um, so again, some commonalities with the research abstract, but um, you have to explicitly state what your capability description is, what your technical approach is. Uh, relevance to the warfighter needs to be a little bit uh, more honed in on for, for this, this abstract, um, as well as status of your technology, what the readiness level is, that kind of thing. Um, both abstracts, of course, have to cue to the principles outlined on the previous slide, are evaluated by the same broad metrics, uh, which include abstract writing quality, scientific merit, um, and again, still relevance to the warfighter and the DoD and military at large. Um, but yes, that's all I wanted to say about MHSRS and abstracts. And I think I will turn it over to our next section, which I know all of you have probably been waiting for. Great. Thanks a lot, Aditya. So we are really honored to have with us retired Colonel Stuart Tyner uh, joining us today. We've known Stuart for several years now, uh, primarily through MHSRS and companies that we've worked with in the infectious disease space. He has over 20 years experience leading research in medical health care teams. Um, as you can see here on his slide, he comes to us as the former director, newly retired, probably only since December, um, but the former director of the Military Infectious Disease Research Program, also known as MIDRIP. Um, he's managed a $500 million global infectious disease research and development program. He's the former chair of the Joint Program Committee, some will know as JPC2 and the former director of DHA Infectious Disease Portfolio. And he's got a, a ton of other credentials that just make him um, such an expert in this particular area. He also serves as a, an adjunct professor at Uniform Services University. And he's been attending MHSRS since 2011, when it was back then called like the Advanced Technology Applications for Combat Casualty Care Conference. And that you think MHSRS is a mouthful, that one is too. But without further ado, Stuart, Stuart we'd love to have you come on camera, um, maybe give some opening remarks. And then I know we wanna jump into some Q&A and just have this be an open dialogue and involve okay. the community that's on, on the call with us. Yeah, <clears throat> good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Greg. and. Um... Thank you, Liz and Aditya and all the G2G team for um, having me be a part of this uh, webinar and symposium. I, <clears throat> I think this is really, really important, um, very important for attendees to understand how they can maximize their experience at MHSRS and, and really leverage that experience in order to further uh, what you're doing. You know, as Greg mentioned, I've been involved since uh, with MHSRS back when it was called ATAC, um, and it was only combat casualty care, and I've sort of seen it grow over the years into uh, including operational medicine and uh, infectious diseases, among other things. Um, and this meeting is really the, the premier military research meeting of the year. Um, <clears throat> it is not ChemBio focused. DITRA does host a large ChemBio 
uh, meeting. This is all um, medical infectious combat casualty care and uh, military operational medicine diseases that uh, or, or uh, research areas. Um, but it is an enormous meeting and it's a really important meeting. And uh, personally, I think it's really important because it's an opportunity to meet those that are decision makers uh, within the DOD R&D um, R&D realm uh, and those that have influence um, and advise decision makers uh, for specific areas. Um, so as, as Greg mentioned, I led the MIDRIP, which is also known as JPC2, um, and then was appointed as the DHA Infectious Diseases Portfolio Director. Um, what did that mean? That meant um, that I led the medical infectious diseases um, R&D efforts from the, the idea up through um, the equivalent of a phase two proof of concept study uh, for the DOD, which, which was Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, and Marine. That was sort of the, the DHA portfolio wrap, roped, uh, wrapped its arms around all of those efforts. Um, the, the portfolio itself uh, was four services, uh, 10 different labs um, all around the world, um, and four infectious diseases focused on six areas uh, for innovation. Um, that did not include the restoral budget that I also managed, uh, which probably added across the five-year planning cycle, maybe another couple hundred million, um, depending, give or take, uh, here or there. Um, you may not know, but uh, if, if your company does receive a congressional ad, sometimes uh, companies receive congressional ads through the NDAA, um, and we're seeing more and more of those. Those typically are managed by the directors of these different research programs. They flow through um, a process where the, the director's office manages and oversees uh, those efforts. So without further ado, I don't want to take up too much time. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk more about MHSRS and address any questions anybody has. Great. Thanks, Stuart. So um, Aditya, let's go to this slide just for a moment. So we, we're going to kick things off with, we want to have just kind of a, I don't know that you'd say this a fireside chat, but just a, a round robin of just interacting with, with, um, with uh, Stuart around MHSRS. If you want to ask a question, feel free to jump in by using the Q&A chat. So um, I think everybody knows how to find that in Zoom. And if not, here's a little link for that. But um, we can go ahead and kick this off, Stuart, just with um, an overview of looking at MHSRS. It covers a broad spectrum of topics related to military medicine and, and the health system. What would be your advice to a first time attendee or a company in terms of navigating the conference? So that's a, that's a great question, Greg. And so if you're a first time attendee, um, I really think that you probably want to get a, a broad perspective of what the military health system research enterprise is. And so I, I would recommend you attend the, the opening sessions um, and you listen to those talks uh, by the leaders of the military health system, which would include the director of DHA, the commander of the Medical Research and Development Command, um, the director of, uh, of R&D under the Assistant Secretary of the Army, for Health Affairs, sometimes uh, the A ASA Health Affairs also gives a talk. These are going to be very broad talks um, and sort of uh, you know thirty thousand foot level, but um, it does help outline where the DoD is going and the large problems that it is trying to think about. Um, from there, I would I would go to the initial plenary talks. The initial plenary talks are chosen um, based on the quality of the work, the broad appeal uh, for that particular topic. Uh, most of the time, they're pretty hot. They're things that the DOD is very concerned about at that time. Um, they do change frequently. One, one year, um, it was all about prolonged field care, and the next year, it's all about what we're seeing in Ukraine, which kind of does tie into uh, prolonged field care. Um, and other years, it's about AI and, and the revolution that AI is uh, a part of within the R&D community. So these are a couple areas that I would really focus on. That's in the very first day. It's in the morning. Um, and then I would find my breakout sessions that I'm really interested in. And as Aditya mentioned, there's four large uh, kind of buckets that these breakout sessions fit in. Um, you can get lost in this meeting. I want to say there's around 4,000 attendees. It's not a, it's not a small meeting. Um, but, you know, once you've listened to uh, the, speaks, the, the speakers, you know, I really found great value in going to the um, 
uh, to the poster sessions, believe it or not. I mean, I think really the poster sessions is kind of where the, the science that's happening right now is being presented. And uh, typically that's a great way to interact with the scientists that's presenting the work. Uh, you get a chance to talk, you know, sort of scientist to scientist, think about problems that they're having, um, think about what you're working on and whether or not your solution might fit. Maybe they're a good collaborator. Um, that, that's really, I think, where most of the um, uh, relationships that happen between scientists would actually happen. Um, it's hard to do that in a breakout session when you have 10 or 15 talks, each one of them kind of going in rapid fire. The speakers often want to listen to the other talks. It's hard to, to kind of go select that person and then, and then introduce yourself. So I really found excellent, great value um, within the, uh, the poster sessions. I would not uh, skip the vendors. I, I think the vendors are, are interesting. Um, I, I also found, found kind of great value in going through there and kind of talking to them about what they're working on, what they're developing, and thinking about um, how that might fit within, within my program. And then the final thing, and I, I really, I can't overstate this enough. It, it's the informal meetings that happen after the science has been presented that really are important in MHSRS. And there are a number of meetings that happen across the uh, three days, the first three days of the conference in the evening. Uh, there's sort of social sessions that happen. Um, and that's a great opportunity uh, because the leaders of the DOD research uh, community are there, the advisors that advise those leaders are there. And it's a great way to you know, talk to them, meet them, give them a card, and then follow up uh, post-meeting with them. That's great. And just one addition to the to the vendors that um, as a new company, I've also, as we've helped escort new companies there, it's nice that you um, uh, the military medical development uh, agency and MRDC and some of those funding entities also have booths. So, so I think, um, you know, the DOD um, uh, uh, funders and, and SBIR programs are also there. So it's kind of intermixed with um, vendors who are trying to sell product to the, to the military as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of a good venue to, if you don't know where to start, you can also find some people there too. That's right. Um, so we have some questions right off the bat from some some folks in the audience, and somebody is asking, um, to what extent is cancer a focus of DOD research and development? Do you have any insights into that? You know that that's actually a great question. Um, the the uh, the largest pot of money, I believe, that falls under the congressionally directed medical research program (CDMRP) is I believe the cancer research, I think it's a breast cancer research program. There's a lot of funding that flows through the congressionally directed medical research program. The acronym for that is CDMRP. And uh, some of it is focused on cancer, not, not just breast cancer, but other forms of cancer. Um, and you can find that within the, um, the sub uh, uh, research programs that CDMRP manages. I just mentioned breast cancer is one of those. The other one would be the peer-reviewed medical research program. Um, those particular topics are chosen by Congress. They change uh, year in and year out, although some are um, on there multiple years in a row. Oftentimes, there is a focus on specific types of cancer in the peer-reviewed medical research program. And then the, um, the orthopedic research program uh, that they manage also has a small focus on some or orthopedic cancers. Um, it's, it's, it's an area that is large in terms of funding of external performers. It is not an area that the DOD, um, what, we, what I call the requirements-driven research programs focus on. And by requirements-driven, what I mean is um, the DOD looks across, looks at problems and decides whether or not it has a solution for that problem. If it doesn't have a solution for that problem, it can't buy a solution for that problem, um, then it invests money in developing a solution for that problem. So that problem becomes a requirement. And so the requirements driven part of the research apparatus uh, is really focused almost exclusively on uh, the health of service members that are deployed and then their ability to deploy. 
And even though cancer is something that would prevent someone from deploying, um, it's not funded to a high degree uh, within MRDC. I hope that that answered your question. I think that was a, a great response. Thanks, Stu. Another one that has come through from the audience is specifically around respiratory medicine. Is that an area of focus or how to, does that overlay with any of the areas of focus? And if so, um, how would they identify that, the priorities within that? That's a great question. So respiratory medicine, I think, would fall mostly under um, combat casualty care, the combat casualty care research program. And it would be very, very focused on what we call far forward remote or prolonged field care. Um, so this is where you, know, you have a, a conflict in which, um, unlike Iraq and Afghanistan, where we could land a helicopter and fly somebody out to a hospital very quickly, um, now there's going to be some significant delays, both in treatment and the ability to evacuate. And so that's, that's sort of writ large, the focus uh, right now for combat casualty care research. Most of it is focused what we call far forward. So it would be in the area where you are um, at, you either are getting receiving medic care or you are at the first surgeon, which is really the damage control surgery site. Um, more in-depth respiratory care, I think would, would end up being uh, probably in more of the definitive uh, medical care centers. So those are the med centers that are back in the United States. Um, and that, so that really depends on what you mean by respiratory medicine. Um, there's definitely respiratory medicine priorities within the military burn research program. That's another program that's managed by the congressionally directed medical research program. There's certainly immediate life-saving interventions that, that go into uh, respiratory medicine and airway management. Um, but then there are more you know, advanced uh, things that, that the DOD does work on um, through intensivists that are uh, critical care intensivists that are uh, experts in that, in that area. I think where you could find the priorities, um, if, if you happen to be a member of the Medical Technology Enterprise Consortium, it's called MTEC, M-T-E-C, um, those priorities by the different research programs are listed um, under the annual open call. And the annual open call, another acronym, is M-P-A-I. That's Mike Papa Alpha India, M-P-A-I. And each one of the programs lists its priorities there and then the things that they're actually interested in investing. Um, another great way to, to go and, and, and really engage closely with research directors is at the annual MTech meeting. Uh, that meeting is uh, normally held in May. Um, some years it's in Baltimore, last year it was in Richmond. And it's a much smaller meeting and you get a chance to really rub elbows with people and you can ask them specific questions you know, such as what are their priorities for uh, respiratory medicine? Great. How does one go about becoming a preferred vendor? Um, give some examples around biotech, um, but becoming a preferred vendor for current or future research projects. You know that, so that's a great question. And that um, just, I'm going to do my best to answer it. It falls sort of outside of, of research. It's more in procurement, um, but Really, the way I would approach that is talking to the U.S. Army Medical Materiel Agency, or the, um, um, I've forgotten the acronym, it's the Defense Medical Logistics Agency. So either U.S. Army Medical Materiel Agency or the Defense Medical Logistics Agency. Those agencies are engaged in uh, looking at and selecting vendors um, that, that can work within the, the DOD in order to supply um, specific items, whether you're talking about you know, medical items or maybe uh, something for um, diagnostics. That's how I, you know, I would recommend that you go and, um, and uh, work with those agencies in order to, be, to see how you could become a preferred vendor. Got it. Um, we've got questions coming in. So if uh, we're gonna get to as many as we can, I'm gonna um, probably cut them off here in, in the next five to six minutes or so, just so we have some time to finish up, but great participation. Another question from a participant is, would the DOD be interested in a diagnostic test that can detect sepsis in one and a half hours, including the uh, genus and species? Yes. <laughs> 
that's an easy one. Um, uh, and so, you, you know, that depends. Uh, but yes, uh, sepsis is a major focus area for the both the combat casualty care research program and the and MIDRIP, the organization I ran, the military infectious diseases research program. Uh, the ability to detect sepsis early, maybe um, speciate would be fantastic. Um, if there was a way to even do a rapid um, AST so you could tell the antimicrobial susceptibilities, that'd be even better. Um, but yes, that is a major need uh, for the DOD. And if you're in the sepsis world, um, there's not a lot of diagnostics out there that are FDA approved. There is one from Beckman Culture, um, but it's, it's pretty big. And so um, the way you need to think about that is time is incredibly important, obviously but also size and weight is huge. So if you have a device that can detect sepsis in one to one and a half hours, and it's as big as a table, it's probably not gonna get procured by the DOD. There's only so much room that is available on airframes or in vehicles in order to transport equipment. And so the DOD thinks about things when it's transporting in terms of numbers of airframes or numbers of ships that it needs in order to, to transport things. So really you're looking at um, something that's rapid and accurate, but also is small and does not weigh much. But yes, it's absolutely a priority. That would be, I would, I would start with the, medical, the military infectious disease research program with that. You, you answered his follow-up question was what agency would be best to approach with it? So that, that's great. Um, would the conference be helpful for academic researchers looking to translate the results into DOD relevant applications through a startup or licensing? licensing? Yep. Um, so the DOD does license technology, but typically it licensed technology that's that's you know able to it's it's ready to be licensed uh, and ready to be commercialized. Um, if you're looking at, as an academic scientist, if you're looking at starting a startup yourself, maybe through a university incubator, and then uh, moving that out and trying to partner with the DOD, that's absolutely possible. There's a lot of organizations that do that. Um, and I would say it really depends on your area of expertise and what you're working on. So this is really where understanding the priorities are critical. And I'll give you a good example. The Military Infectious Disease Research Program uh, invests heavily in, in wound infections. Um, but by wound infections, it does not mean chronic wounds, does not mean diabetic wounds, does not mean pressure ulcers. It does not mean other types of, of chronic wounds. What it means is a infection immediate to uh, a traumatic injury. So you have a traumatic injury in the field, you have a dirty wound, you can't clean it out very well, and then you develop an infection. That's specifically what the military is talking about in that example. And, and so by saying that, what I'm trying to convey is that it's really those, those, those discussions with research leaders are really important because you're able to suss out what do they really mean by this problem? What, how can I help? What is my research uh, focus that, that can be leveraged in order to support this? And would the military be interested in that? So I, I think it is a good meeting. Um, if you have an area of research that fits in within some of the more specific uh, breakout areas, not just the broad, you know, warfighter performance and return to duty and all that, but really uh, nails it down into a specific um, uh, breakout session topic, then I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to go. Um, and in that instance, I probably would be interested in um, maybe doing a poster because you're gonna be in a poster session around others that are all working in similar fields. And it's a good, it's a good area to uh, begin to kind of cross pollinate and talk with uh, some of the scientists that you might wanna collaborate with. It's a great plug for submitting an abstract, which <laughs> yes. we do next week, so yeah. What's the DOD's current thinking toward pain management, both in theater and, um, in theater and out with respect to opioid versus non-opioid prolonged care. Any yeah. thoughts on that? Um, so the DOD is very concerned about pain management um, far forward and how it's gonna do that effectively. It has an entire research area focused on novel uh, pain management techniques. Um, 
as you know, most of the pain management tools are opioid. There is one that's non-opioid. Um, and they tend to, those that are, that are delivering that care tend to favor non-opioid. I mean, when you have somebody that's, that's blown up or shot, you know, it's losing blood. The last thing you want to do is, is lower the heart rate and decrease blood pressure. Um, so non-opioid pain management would be really good. Um, there may be other ways to think about pain management far forward. Um, maybe it's an anesthetic, uh, you know, um, maybe it's a nerve block. Um, th those things are not used right now uh, within the DOD. Um, and, and many of those other solutions that don't require a specialist, they don't require an anesthesiologist to administer or a nurse anesthetist to administer, but could be administered by those that um, have less training, um, they're primed to be explored, right? Th those are things that, that could be explored uh, fairly, you know, I don't wanna say easily, nothing is easy in R&D, but, but more easy than um, if you're going from an, an idea through development, but if something is already commercially available and you wanna look at its use, um, the DOD is a great place to partner with. The, the DOD laboratories are a great place to partner in order to assess whether that works uh, for their particular use case. So I, I would say combat casualty care, um, I would talk to the, the um, uh, what they call the program area manager for pain management within combat casualty care and uh, really understand where they're going and what they're thinking about and how you might be able to uh, collaborate with them. Um, we've got time for a couple more, and then we've got a few more slides that we want to get to. But um, one of the questions here is, what's the best way to understand the DOD's priority with women's health? And so maybe specifically that, but then in a broader context, I know you talked about priorities, but maybe come back to how can companies, what should companies be doing to find priorities that align for them? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great question. And so there's there's a couple, you know, there's specific uh, questions about women's health that are critical, um, that really only pertain to women. And then there are um, gender-based differences in how you deliver care, depending upon what type of care that you're delivering that are inherent within each of those, each of the three um, requirements-driven programs, that's combat casualty care, infectious disease, and military operational medicine. Um, now women's health, um, I'm trying to remember if it's actually a, a portfolio. I don't think it is its own portfolio yet, um, but I think it probably will be. And um, I would say going to this meeting and, and, and going to the different breakout sessions within Women's Health will give you a good sense of where the DOD is headed with respect to research um, in that particular area. Um, I don't think that would be a waste of time. I think it would actually be a good way to understand uh, where the priorities are and, and where they think there are gaps. Um, I, I just inquired today whether or not DHA actually lists the research priorities and I got kind of a, it kind of does and kind of doesn't, but by the summer it will um, answer. And, and so um, it's probably not the answer you wanna have uh, and I'm sorry about that, but uh, DHA will be um, for the programs listing uh, the different areas that they innovate in um, on, on its website. It won't go into great detail, but it will tell you specific areas. And at least you could, at that point, be, be able to pinpoint um, who's the owner of that portfolio, because that's really who you want to interface with, is that individual that's making decisions about how funding is being, is being used. Great. Thanks, Stuart. So I know we have a couple other slides. Um, Aditya, if we could pull those back up and um, specifically wanted to talk about a couple other conferences that we want to make sure that attendees are aware of. And that is specifically um, the Operational Medicine Symposium. I know you've had some experience at this one as well. Um, you want to give kind of a, an overview of um, this conference and how it sure. aligns? Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was a speaker at a, at a Q and A session last year at the Operational Medicine Symposium, and I, I attended two other meetings um, previous to that. And it's really grown, and it, it's actually uh, more focused on improving combat casualty care. That's really the focus of the Operational Medicine Symposium. But that overlays with operational medicine and also um, infectious diseases. So you do find components of the three large 
uh, programmatic research er efforts at the Operational Medicine Symposium. I mean, I would say that uh, it, it's completely focused on operational medicine. That means from the, you know, the way I would look at it is from the point of injury to probably what they call a role three, which is a combat support hospital or a field hospital. So in between there, you have a medic station and then you have um, a uh, emergency surgical unit um, that could do some, what they call damage control surgery. Um, so this sort of that realm from the point of injury to a field hospital, not a definitive, not a real hospital that is able to deliver definitive care, but a field hospital. Um, that's the area that, that it's focused on. And it's a much smaller meeting. Um, you know, it's hundreds of people instead of thousands. And so you get a much more intimate ability to interact with research leaders there. Great. And then the um, special operations conference, which is coming up in yeah. like May. That, that's a great meeting. Um, I, I will say that the, the SOMA meeting, um, uh, this meeting is it's interesting because it's actually a good meeting to go to the talks. Um, the actual uh, talks as opposed to, I mean, there are posters, but it's not quite as robust in the poster session. A, a big focus of this meeting is hands-on um, workshops. So it's full of workshops being led by those that are in the field. So this is really a medic focused meeting. So those individuals that are, whether they're a special forces medic or a regular medic, um, those individuals that are delivering care at the point of injury and before they get to, to a surgeon. That's really the focus. So it is austere medicine. It is um, um, doing um, very um, involved things with those that may not have the amount of training that uh, some others have. And so it's really focused on, on, on learning and vignettes. The, the presentations themselves often present some of the unique problems that they really are dealt, that they really have to deal with within those scenarios. And it's a great way to understand kind of what, what the users of the particular technology really think about and consider to be the problems that we need to solve. I, 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 I think it's a great meeting. <clears throat> I think it also underscores just with the theme for MHSRS and these two conferences and your comments about MTech that there are advantages to the the 4,000 side, like the premier conference to be there and to hear yes. directly from the leaders. And then the smaller ones, you could hear from similar pro, similar types of presenters from DOD, but you may not be elbowing your way to try to get to them after they speak. Right, no, that's, that's correct. As a, as a director of a research program, you are just inundated with people at MHSRS that wanna to talk to you, wanna meet with you. Um, Every time you turn around, there's somebody that wants to give you a card. They want to eat with you. They want to talk to you while you're walking to the next session. They want to talk to you in the session, you know, at the vendor show. It doesn't matter. And it's really difficult to sort of separate the, the wheat from the chaff in that particular instance. So if you do have that opportunity to address one of the directors and you do get a chance to, you know, talk to them about what you do, give them your business card, I highly recommend that you follow up um, maybe a week to 10 days later. Um, and, and offer to, uh, you know, present your research uh, to that team. Um, some of the teams handle that differently. Some teams want to do the presentations. Some teams push you to the new idea website. Personally, I don't like, I, I really don't like the new idea website. I much prefer interacting with people. Um, but that gives you an opportunity to, to really talk and showcase what it is that your, you or your company do uh, or, or your university does and how you might be a good partner uh, for them. Um, I, I, would, uh, I would be persistent. I, I would uh, not take sort of no, we're too busy right now for an answer. I'd say, well, okay, well, when are you not too busy? Maybe I'll circle back in a couple of weeks. I understand your schedule might be you know, packed right after such a large meeting. And then just circle back um, because th there are times in the year when when sort of the noise does die down a little bit and you have an opportunity to listen and talk. And uh, personally, I, I believe that the directors as part of the job is, is to do um, sort of tech scouting and understand what's out there. And so I, I encourage you all to make those connections and then follow up and continue to follow up until you're able to get a, get a meeting with people. Great. That's a really good segue into our final slide, which are some tips uh, 
for engaging DOD, MHS, or SN Beyond. And Stu, I think you just summed it all up with our very last bullet point, which is be persistent. I mean, we I would I mean that to me sums it all up. Um, we will make the slides available to everybody. We'll send that up as a follow-up. I just wanted to run through a couple of these, um, certainly um, starting with some tracking opportunities. So getting a sense of when these conferences are happening, what, what opportunities, what vehicles. Um, Stuart mentioned CDMRP. Um, there are also broad agency announcements, which we didn't have a, a bunch of time to talk about, but there, there are opportunities for that. So tracking that. Um, convey your messaging is really important. Um, we recommend a very succinct um, formula of what's the problem, solution, and results, and do that in one page or maybe two pages at most. Include some maybe a graph or a visual that helps convey the, the uh, points that you want to make. But having something like that at the ready when you go to a conference, any of these conferences, to Stuart's point that the the program managers, the directors are all busy and um, you could offer to hand that to them. They've got something to take away to read on the plane or you can follow up and send it in. But messaging succinct is really important. Um, understanding the goals. What are the program goals? What are the intents? What's the award mechanism? All kind of align with what we've been talking about here in terms of goals and priorities that the military has. Talking with program managers, I think one of the biggest challenges is figuring out who those people are, but going to conferences like this, you see them in the flesh, um, you can find them on the website, sometimes it's admittedly um, a kind of a cat and mouse game as to how to navigate the websites, They're, every program, the DOD is just so big, um, it, it could be hard to navigate and find exactly where those individuals live or who they are, but going to these types of events get you exposure to the to who the decision makers are and who's um, uh, managing the portfolios. Um, when you're submitting, definitely follow the deadlines and the budget guidelines. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that companies can make is missing that deadline. Um, they're generally hard deadlines and definitely following the guidelines and rules. One of the big, uh, the easiest ways to uh, put Put a, a proposal aside is that it didn't meet the requirements. So there are a lot of other um, great tips here that um, we'll share with you. Stu's mentioned MTech and these other consortiums, and then other collaborative ideas, which uh, is a whole other section we could talk about as far as CRADAs and how you can do cooper cooperative research with the military or do material transfer agreements. Um, there, there are just a whole bunch of opportunities. So we hope that this tips slide will come in handy. And I will, um, before we close here, I'm not seeing any other questions, but Stu, I want to give you kind of the last word of um, anything that jumped out of from this slide that you want to leave folks with or that we didn't have a chance to cover in just the Q&A section. Sure. Um, and thank you for that time. And thank you guys for the time to, to, to speak to you. Uh, I, I think when it comes down to um, getting the DOD to listen and then balancing that with your with your own ability to just manage all the balls in the air that you've got up on your side. I, I would I think about things as like how much how many calories am I going to have to burn to submit a white paper or a grant, et cetera. And I, I really would look at those areas that enable you to submit your idea um, in a very succinct way, as, as Greg mentioned, whether that's uh, a white paper or an executive summary just to get folks interested. Um, <clears throat> there often is, it's, it's less work on your side. Um, and um, believe it or not, it, it's less work on the program director's side because they have less that they have to read. Um, and, and, and they're able to turn around um, and answer fairly rapidly. With respect to that, there's a lot of different funding mechanisms. We, we talked about a number of them. I would say if it's if you're an MTech member and you have the open call, it's a great way to get your idea in front of decision makers. It doesn't mean it's going to get funded, but what it does enable the decision maker to do is take a look at that idea for a couple of years. Believe it or not, priorities and funding change. Uh, money becomes available that wasn't available at the beginning of the year. Uh, Greg mentioned restoral funds. And sometimes that really great idea that doesn't have funding at the beginning of the year to put against it, all of a sudden, 
has some restoral funds that may be able to put against it. And um, it's because uh, that, that great idea was sent in to the program directors and they get a chance to think about it and look at it and then make a decision. That happens all the time. So um, I would just be very strategic about how you think about writing grants and, and looking for DOD funding and then follow those pathways that, uh, that are gonna give you the best chance for success. Great, thank you, Stuart. And Aditya, we could go to the final slide, just a quick close out to thank everybody. Um, our contact information is here, so feel free to reach out to us. Just to reiterate, we will send out the slides in a follow-up email. You're welcome to contact us. And I would just put in a plug that if you are interested and have not attended our Government Bioscience Grants Report webinar, it's tomorrow from noon to one Eastern time, and you're all welcome to, to join. So Stuart, Stuart, thanks again for joining us. And to everybody else, thank you and have a great day. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.